Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, October 16, 2014, and this is a week in charts. I know I say this every week, but um, I think with the developing market situation, I, I really mean it this week. We got a lot to cover, so I'm going to get a little jacked up in Mountain Dew. Actually, um, forgot to get some Mountain Dew again this week, so I'm going to have some community coffee. Mm -hmm. That is good stuff. If the makers of community coffee are out there listening, give me a shout out. Give you uh, an endorsement here. Here's a disclaimer screen. Let me just sum it up for you. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. This is a part of the show where I beg for a book review. Uh, I'm not ashamed to ask for them because people send me uh, all the time. They say, uh, hey. They're like, hey, Dave, I like the book, um, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, well, can you put me up a review? And the reason I ask for reviews is some people are malignant, and they review the reviews. I'm just thinking. I thought about it. I was listening to, the, I listen to my chart shows um, after I do them just to see if I say something stupid or not. <laughs> and um, I was thinking, I guess that's a negative way to start the show, talking about uh, malignant people. Um, but anyway, throw me a bone if you don't mind. All right, we're going to talk about, well, we're going to continue on the emerging trend patterns from all-time highs. And that's an important concept because it's worked out very nicely lately. And I'm going to flesh that out in a lot more details. Um, I want to touch upon the um, understanding sardines and stocks, meaning that uh, these are vehicles to be traded based on the old sardine story, which I'll retell yet again this week. But I have these little epiphanies at, at, with this educational business throughout the years, and it's been kind of wonderful for me from a selfish standpoint. It forces me to do the right thing, and I'm able to see things, uh, not all the time more clearly, but in general, as a general statement, more clearly, um, because knowing that you have to report to someone. I had a, a, a business partner years ago, and I was the chief technical analyst with uh, his fund, and, and he would always say, you know, Dave's not necessarily always right, but Dave's not wishy-washy. You know where you stand. You know how he feels um, about the market. And he was able to take those forecasts and use them, knowing that, they, of course, obviously they won't always be right. So that's one thing that, that was a very nice thing that I thought he said about me. Um, micromanagement rears its ugly head as it always does or quite often does so we'll talk about that anything you want me to discuss today uh, start thinking about it now let me know and we'll be happy to uh, work it in as time allows when we get to the charts if you don't mind ask about well for, first of all hold off on your stock questions until we get to the charts and we should have I, I know we have a lot to cover but we should have plenty of time to get to all of your stocks this week once we do get to the charts just ask about stocks one stock at a time okay uh, and what else? I think that's it. Do you ever exit up a chart related? Do you ever exit? Oh, ooh, half a cup of coffee next time, Dave. <laughs> Do you ever exit a position for chart related reasons other than trigger buy stop or profit target? No. For example, yesterday SKX was actually up for a good part of the day, even when the SPX was down significantly. And today, XKX has been about flat. Does it signal you to perhaps? SKX is not worth shorting in favor of other opportunities. Okay. Well, you say not worth shorting. We're already short, okay? So if you enter a position and you get an entry and you're short, then stay short, okay? If you're in a position and you're long, then stay long until you're stopped out. And I'm going to flesh that out in a lot more details in just a few minutes. But if you go back to the RAD example, no, um, I guess no pun intended. We had a sell-off in here, which, if memory serves, was also a bow tie. And it pulled back a little bit, and it triggered an entry somewhere around here. Well, what happened? It kind of meandered around a little bit, didn't do anything, so it's dead money, meaning that it's not making you any money, right? And then what did the market do? The market went on to make all-time highs, basis the P's. And not only did it do that, it gapped higher. It just ran up big time in here, okay? So you're probably thinking, well, market's making new highs. The stock is going straight up. I have a losing position. Maybe I should exit it. Well, if your stop is not hit, there's nothing to do. 
you have to follow your plan. You can't Microsoft, 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 micromanage yourself out of a position. And notice that it did begin to sell off a little bit. And then notice that the market went on to make all-time highs again. And it starts rallying. And once again, if your entry's here, once again, you're at a loss. So now you're three weeks into this trade, maybe a month. Market's making all-time highs. The stock's going the wrong way. You got a loss. What do you do? Well, are you stopped out? If the answer is no, then you stick with it. The market doesn't always move on your time frame. And also, in spite of what these numbskulls, for lack of a worse word, I, I'm sure if I let myself, <laughs> I'll slip and call them something worse. I'm just a man. I'm just, oh, don't get me started. I got an email. I, I don't even know how to say this. My, my name gets on a lot of lists somehow, magically. And I got an email yesterday, and somebody was like, oh, I just uh, uh, signed up for this other service, and I just watched someone make uh, $10,000, and they do it every day and 20 minutes a day. It's like, no, no, you, like, who was it in Caddyshack? No, you don't, Danny. <laughs> it's like, no, no, you don't, there's no, I sound like Nicholas Fine. No, there's no permanent income when it comes to markets. And sometimes novices think that professional traders just go in and make money every day. Trust me, we don't. Okay? And sometimes the market doesn't move on your time frame. More often than not, the market doesn't move on your time frame. You have to follow a system. You have to follow some system. And ideally, you follow a simple system such as mine, okay? It's not my way or the highway. You can go out there and do whatever you want, okay? But I think you'll find, especially if you venture to the complex and arcane, that eventually you'll come full circle, as I often give the trader's journey speech, and you'll come back to do something a lot more simpler today than you would try to do maybe 5, 10, or 15 years ago like I have. I would imagine you'll end up in that same type of journey. So do something simple and follow a simple methodology and that's the best thing to do and follow is the key word in that sentence. Don't get swayed by these people out there that make it sound like you could always print money. Okay? Uh, if you could then they would be very quiet about it and go about their business, okay? But you can't. So nobody is better than you, okay? Now, they might have a little bit more experience than you. They may have been around the block a time or two, and that's the point I was making this morning about the fact that somebody started trading in 2009. They don't have a clue what could happen in the markets, okay? It's like you almost need to have, like Joe Corona once said when he was telling me about training the traders in India when he was over in India. Joe, as you may have heard me talk before, he's a friend of mine, a good guy. Uh, he's worked with Tony Saliba on and off throughout the years. Tony Saliba is a market wizard. And I'm not telling you this to name drop. There's some really good people out there in this industry and uh, I've, I've had the great fortune of meeting quite a few of them and uh, you know these people are truly friends so Joe's a good guy and, and he travels the world looking for opportunities and then he once told me as I wrote about I think in the first book he says Dave I, I like to see the new guys have their ass handed to them right away because only then do they learn to respect risk so anyone who started trading over the last few years doesn't know what's happening right now. They have no idea what's hitting them, okay? The market is rolling over. It might stop today. It's, it's Like I said this morning, I think it's oversold due to bounce. It might just go back up forever. Who knows? We don't know. We're trend followers, okay? But they're not going to know what hit them. And so you have to live through a few cycles. Now, I know I've went off on a tangent. Ha ha, big surprise. But the point is that 
you cannot expect a permanent and constant income out of the markets. There will be zigs, there will be zags. You have to follow the plan, okay? Now, in following the plan, you'll see that so far, we'll st we're, we are still short this stock, okay? Now, let me explain something to you. What does this move percentage-wise, round numbers? Percentage-wise, that's a pretty big number. I don't have the portfolio up at the second. I shut it down because of the to start the, the show. Um, but let's say that's about a two and a half point move. I'm just eyeballing everything. Uh, started at about seven bucks a share. So that's thirty-five percent. That's better than a poke in the eye. Okay. So. If you had a Microsoft, 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 micro manage yourself out of this position, you would have missed a 35% gain so far. And hopefully uh, it'll continue. You know, I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully it'll keep on keeping on. Um, I see it happen all the time. I wrote about it in layman's. I couldn't find it right before that. I should have just brought the PDF up and it, it, it scanned for it. But if you look at layman's, I'm pretty sure I got an example in there where our stock halved overnight and it was a short. And we were in it a couple days, and then I started getting emails from people. Dave, market's going up. Um, I'm sorry, market's going down. The stock's not going down. I'm getting out. I was like, okay, well, do what you want. It's not my way or highway, and you might have your reasons, and that's fine. But I'm going to stick with it. And the reason you want to stick with it is because, again, the market doesn't always move on your time frame. And I spent too much time talking about the outlier aspect of this methodology. And i got to figure out a way, and I've been coached before on this by some of my peers, but I've got to figure out a way to make it sound like it's not elusive, like it's not impossible to catch the outliers, because it is, it is possible to catch the outliers, okay? But the outliers... Or, or the, or the, or the juice. Remember the, the old SNL skits. Uh, you like the juice. Uh, the juice is good. You want the juice, with the Greek shop, and they would go get the juice, and they had this juice. They, they would put it in a sandwich. The juice is good. Well, that's the juice. I don't. I sound in French. I guess I sound more French than Greek, but you get the point. The juice is the outliers. That's what makes it really good. Now, we hit a period early this year where our accuracy went through the roof. We had like 9 out of 9 or 10 out of 10. I forget how many it was. But we didn't hit a lot of – we didn't hit any big winners during that period. So it was nice that it kind of felt like that permanent income thing. But there was no real outlier. So there's no real winners, big winners during that period. And it's nice to hit it. It's nice to be accurate every now and then. It's nice to have a lot of winners in the portfolio. Don't get me wrong. I, I love winners, right? But the occasional big winners is where the real money is. And so far, this has been a pretty good position for us. And so far, so good. So you don't want to micromanage yourself out of those positions, okay? And this is why I have so many dead money reports. And if you go back in, and I thought it was just recently, but I started looking at it. But I have all kinds of dead money reports out there for this year. In fact, this is the, the marketing page for the flash drives for the first half of the year. And I noticed right in the middle of this marketing page, I have the word dead money. So we obviously talked about that in the first half of the year. In fact, I got to thinking because I didn't know whether or not it was in more recent. Um, I thought it might have just been in more recent commentaries. So what I was thinking before the show is that, if I'll make you a deal, if you go to a little, little shameless plug here, bear with me. If you go to get the archives of these shows of the flash drives, which are right here, and if you get the first half of the year, I'll give you everything that we've done since then, too. So I'll give you everything up until today. I'll give you today's, too. Uh, and then that way, I know for sure you have many, many dead money reports along with yet another lesson in micromanagement. And you ask, some of you, your eyes may glaze over when I talk about dead money and micromanagement. Dave, why you talk about that so much? It's like, well, 
it, it reminds me of an Anthony Robbins story about a preacher, and I've told this story quite a few times too, so bear with me. But there was a preacher that kept giving the same sermon, same sermon, same sermon, same sermon. So one of the parishioners went up to him and said, uh, you know, I can't help but notice, Reverend, that um, I guess it's a parishioner. Is a parishioner multi-denominational? Anyway, so I can't help notice it, Reverend, that you keep giving the same sermon every week. And he goes, oh, I'm glad you notice. Right you are. And I will continue to give that same sermon until everybody gets it and starts to listen. And that's why I beat the dead horse so much on so many of these concepts. Okay, Last week, I was looking at my um, show from last week, and I noticed halfway through, uh, I had uh, read my lips, and it was like, hey, Dave, what do you do about news? Well, what if it's this news, or what if it's that news? And, and what if it's earnings, and what if it's... It's like, no, you just ignore all the news, okay? And I guess the point when everybody gets it, my work is done, okay? Don't micromanage, ignore the news, honor your stops, okay? Now, while we're on the beat the dead horse, repetitive, redundant phase, let's talk about sardine drive. The age-old story, again, and I hate to even bring it up, but not everybody here knows it, is that there's allegedly a story where people were trading tens of tuna. And the tens of tuna were going up and up and up and up and up in price. And there was a bubble. So much so, there was a bubble in tens of tuna. So one guy paid some exorbitant price for a tin of tuna. And instead of selling it on to a greater fool, okay, what did he do? By the way, uh, you know, that's something smart to, uh, I was listening to an interview yesterday and with uh, with Greg Morris, and you can get the link off my website. Hey, Greg's a good guy. I'm friends with Greg. We, I, I admire him a lot. I mean, he's kind of a mentor as much as he is a friend. Um and I like what he said. He goes, well, the greater food theory with stocks is that you must sell, if you buy a stock, you must sell it on to a greater fool. You must sell it higher than you bought it. But think about when you buy a stock, you might be that greater fool, okay? So that's something that's kind of interesting. But anyway, I digress. Going back to the sardines, this gentleman decides, instead of trading his sardines on and selling them, or profit, he opens up the tin, decides to have a very expensive lunch, and what happens? He discovers that they're rotten. It's, it's too bad we're not all, I don't have the, the, the audio on. We could all say it together like an advertorial. They're rotten. So he tracks out a guy, bought them from the guys like you, silly fool. Those sardines are for trading and not eating. Okay? Stocks are for trading. As I said last week, a week before, they're not, their stocks are to be called and not collected. Write that down. That's beautiful. If I say so myself. Stocks are to be called and not collected. You should be taking stocks out of your portfolio and not try to collect more and more. Now, as I said earlier, the advantage I have by having this educational business on the retail side is that I see a lot of mistakes that are being made, and it also forces, in, in addition, it forces me to do the right thing. And like I said last week or week before, doctor friend of mine uh, slash client, uh, he did some dumb things recently, and he lost some money. And it's not enough money to ha have a material impact on his life, but he's bummed out because he lost a little money. Now, I have a feeling that if his wife was looking over his shoulder – then he would probably be in a lot more trouble than he really is because it's it's no big deal. He lost a little money, big deal. He probably made back that money over a month with his um, business dealings and through being a doctor. But it was a substantial amount of money, about you know worse than a poker eye, I guess. Uh, better than poker eye, working. I don't say that anyway. 
And what I was thinking was, if his wife was looking over his shoulder, it probably wouldn't be so easy. And I think that's that's sort of by one of the games I play with myself. But trust me, I have the same psychological demons that I think 99.9% .9 of the rest of us have out there too. Okay. But I kind of play a game where I know I have a public portfolio and I didn't have my own portfolio. And a lot of times those two are kind of one and the same. But I know, especially if there's a stock that I'm in that is being seed by the world, I feel like, well, I've got to do the right thing. And if that stock gets hit, i got to get out of it. Now, if it's a stock that I'm in and nobody knows about because it's just my own portfolio, I've got to resist the temptation of hanging on to Hopeville, okay, when that stock hits a stop, I need to make sure I work my way out of that stock as soon as possible. Now, I say work my way out because I do apply a little discretion in my trading, and I do preach discretion, and I do teach discretion, and you could use a little bit, okay, to keep you in the trades. Go back and watch the flash drives from the beginning of the year, and you'll see I talk a lot about that. So the whole point is that stocks or to be traded. And my epiphany, believe it or not, I did have a point to what I'm saying here, but my epiphany last week was that every time a stock enters your portfolio, that stock days are dubbered, okay? And the stock's going to come out two ways. One, you can hit the partial profit, and half is going to come out. And two, it's going to stop out on the remainder, or it'll just stop out on the whole thing, okay? And that's all you have to do once it's in your portfolio, all right? You're in? That's fine. Sketches, you're in. That's great. Analyst upgrades you. Bastard. Pardon my French. I guess he's got to make money somehow. Um, that We'll edit that out. That Was, was that an outside thought? Um, anyway, it's Sketchers. The an analyst upgrades it a couple days ago. What happens? Stock goes straight up. Well, a day or two later, it's already below where the analyst upgraded it. So, yeah, I dropped an F bomb when the analyst upgraded it. Okay, he's got, he's got. I guess he's got to feed his kids too. You know, I shouldn't pick on him. Everybody's got to do something. You know, um, but it's aggravating. Okay. <laughs> But you can't get caught up in the minutia of everything. You can't bail out every time things look a little bad. And you know, as I say often and often, and if you if you got the if you bought Ted Bess over the last ten years, you'll see that one of the things I put in the in the PDF on that that the what's changed PDF uh, that I update usually about once a year, and the what's changed PDF, I said, hey. Patterns are still patterns, and that's great. I'll still use the same thing I invented 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. But what's changed is that there's little things in there, like, for instance, I said, when did Dow get out? Well, that was stupid that I put that in Dave Landry on swing trading. I think I was, look, I was looking for, like, a number 10. I had, like, a top 10 list. And at that time, I believed that because the market was just kind of going up. I mean, I was kind of getting caught up in the in – the, perpetual Kool-Aid of the market at the time, I guess. And it was true. You should not stay in a position that wasn't moving in your favor. Well, times have changed over the last couple of decades to where now you need to um, stick it out, tough it out, and let the stop get hit. And that's, that's all you have to do. So, again, once again, I've simplified things further, as you can see, with the methodology. Now, One other thing about sardine drive before we talk about um, getting back to like stock stays are numbered, and that is that this is a sign that's on the wall of my office, one of the walls of my office, I should say. And I look at it every day, and I kind of grin, kind of giggle a little bit when I look at it. I just love it because it reminds me what I'm doing here. I'm here to trade. Okay, and like I said last week, uh, a client from years ago was taking his trading career very seriously, and he bought him one of the lightweight jackets 
that they wear down on the floor, the colorful lightweight jacket that they wear on the floor of the, um, I guess the CME and the CBOT. I'm not sure how much floor is left in the world. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of like I'll be explaining. Yes, people actually got went down on the floor and traded stocks. This is a picture of a trading floor. This is what it used to look like. I know it's vanishing as we speak. So a stock stays are numbered. And here's the deal. You could stay as long as you behave. I had a house guest once, and I told him, I said, that's fine. You could stay for a little while. Just don't become a dead fish. You know, dead after three days, a company like a dead fish begins to stink, okay? So you could stay as long as you behave. You're... Your stocks, however you want to look at it, whatever whatever game you play, whatever it makes, however it works for you, okay. And and I've I play all these little games to to, to so I could battle my psychological demons, right? So I play little games, and it's kind of like, okay, you're a guest, you know, welcome, come on in, and I'm pretty excited to put a new stock in, okay. I'm not so much the pessimist that I may seem about the portfolio because I'm always excited. I, I can't wait to find a new stock. And I, and I get a big cup of coffee, uh, community coffee, uh, every day at the end of the close. And uh, I, I uh, Or sometimes even before the market closes if, if I'm not too busy with the markets and other um, projects. And I go on that treasure hunt every day. And I love, I love doing what I do. It's fun. I, I can't believe I get paid to do this. Um, it's a lot of work, and sometimes it does wear me down a little bit and think, geez, this is a lot of work. Uh, but for the most part, I really enjoy it, especially when the market cooperates. And in that little treasure hunt, if I find something, I get excited, and I can't wait to welcome it in. It's kind of like when your guests show up, and you just said, wait for them to show up, show up, show up, and, you know, hugs and kisses and everything when they when they hit the door. But after about... Three days, it's like, well, shoot, it's time for you to go. Now, treat the stocks the same way. Now, I'm not saying get out after three days. If they're just if they're just performing and just doing fantastic, then you stay with them as long as they perform. So, it's sort of, you have to play these little games where, or these analogies, or however you want to use it, where you look at these things and treat them like house guests. Treat them like employees, okay? That's another great way of looking at it, okay? Um, as a client recently emailed me and said he used to treat his stocks like child, like children. And, and I've used the employee analogy many times. And with the child, you're like, oh, okay, you effed up, but uh, it'll be okay. And, uh, you know, I made mistakes when I was your age, too. Come on, little fella, it'll be okay. And, and you hope to steer them in the right direction and, and, and know that they're going to make some mistakes along the way. A stock is like an employee. You F up, you're out, okay? And you got to treat them like that. It, it, it's like a bus. There's going to be another one along soon. So anyway, the whole epiphany, long story endless, the whole epiphany is that as soon as a stock enters a portfolio, their days are numbered. Now, we might get out two and a half years from now on that stock. We might get out two and a half days from now. We might get out two and a half hours from now, or it could even be, God forbid, I've seen it happen. And it's painful. And, and you talk about f bobs, two and a half minutes. <laughs> I mean, something you get in, and all of a sudden, something bad happens. Okay, so it happens. Trust me. So just realize that as soon as one goes in, as soon as it goes in, it's coming out. Okay. Howard says the market is always right, so honor your stops. Money management is key. Amen, Howard. Have you got his number? Have you got his number? Whose number? <laughs> Yeah, uh, Howard says good money management fixes many, many, many mistakes. Well, my claim to fame with money management, I've actually been quoted on this, as I said, money management will cure a multitude of sins. And I actually got that. It's kind of funny that the story, the origin of that is it's like I broke a piece. I've got a, a classic car of a story, and, and I was fiddling around with it. I broke a piece off of it, and, you know, I actually went to the dealership, and they laughed at me, you know, and I said, uh, I got a 1975 Pontiac. They're like, well, what? <laughs> it's like they laughed at me. So uh, after going to auto parts stores and all, it was, it was, the part was impossible to find. So I bought some um, 
uh, some JV Weld, which is a strong epoxy, uh, strong in that it it uh, it could withstand heat, and the part was going to go in the engine, which would get hot. And it, so I fixed the little part. And I, well, as I'm buying the stuff, the guy behind the counter, you know, we got the chit chat, and he, he said, uh, he said, "What are you working on?" I told him, and I said, "Yeah, I broke this thing." And I said, "I'm going to." I'm going to fix it with J.B. Weld, and he says, well, and he's he's an ex-mechanic, as a lot of these guys are, or if you're lucky enough to get an ex-mechanic when you go to an auto parts store. He says, well, Dave, J.B. Weld will cure a multitude of sins. And then when I got to writing about money management, I started thinking about, you know, money management will cure a multitude of sins. And, you know, the aforementioned doctor I was just talking about, he's probably listening now and cursing me for bringing him up. But I, I like to beat him up a little bit because I'd like to see him do the right thing because he knows better. And he had some, some positions to get away from him, obviously. Well, the way – every now and then something will gap through a stop or something. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is not honoring your stop. And having a 50% loss on the books when you stop, you should have stopped out at 10 or 15 percent long time ago. That is a problem. And money management will cure a multitude of sins. Okay. Or the sardines being carried on the SS sheep dip. I don't know. <laughs> Probably. I mean the. Um, Today's column is uh, on the SS Sheep Dip, and if you go back a few columns, you'll see um, the SS, SS Sheep Dip. Uh, we had a bear knocking on the. Uh, it's kind of funny. I think right at the top of the market, I put. I thought it would jinx the market, but I, I had a bear on the um, on the cover. There's an old uh, there's an old saying: when you see the bear on the cover, it means you're going to have a bullish trend. When you see a bull on the cover, it means that's the beginning of the bear market. Uh, but yeah, it was called SS Sheep Dip. Was uh, one of the recent columns on that so that's where that's coming from okay um let's uh finish up these slides and then we'll hop into the market um now last couple of weeks we talked about emergent trend patterns off of all-time highs and like i said he's like why am i beating a dead horse on here because it's important it's important because after an all-time high the most amount of people are trapped on the wrong side of the market and every top will have signals. Write that down. Every top will have signals. And I wrote in a column a couple days ago, go in and look at all historical tops and markets. Go back to 1929. Or go back further than that if you can. Get some, uh, get some charts on Japanese stocks going back 1,000 years, okay, if you can find them. Uh, if you could find charts on uh, South Sea Bubble and Tulip Bubble and stuff like that, that'd be awesome too. Please let me know if you do. I, I, I'm just kind of thinking about it, thinking out loud right now. It'd be awesome to go in and look to see what kind of signals you had then. If you could get the data, it'd be awesome. But look at the 1929 top. Look at um, all these other tops throughout history. 2000, 2002, 2003 bottom, okay, um, this top we just had. Okay, and you're going to see that there were signs. Every top will have an emerging trend signal or sign. Bow tie, first thrust, or some of these other patterns. But I guarantee you they will be there. But not everyone will turn into the mother of all tops. Okay, bottoms too, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I know I beat the dead horse with the weekly, uh, with the weekly bow ties. But let's see what this is. But as I often show in these, uh, no, this is not what I was hoping it was. As I often show in these shows that if you go back to 2000, 2002, 2003 bottom, we had a nice weekly bow tie there. And I'll show it to you in the real charts in a few minutes. But absolutely, every bottom, every top will have signs, okay? We're just talking about tops because we're at a top. The most people are still on the wrong side of the, or trapped on the wrong side of the market because everybody's happy during the uptrend, like I wrote last week. Okay, so everybody's happy. The market comes up here and begins to roll over. Well, everybody, at least everybody, 
from there and below is still happy because it's still at a profit. But as this drops, let's say you get a little bow tie, it starts to roll over, these people back here become more and more unhappy. And these, oops, unhappy. And these people over here, the Johnny Come Latelys, they're going to be the first to bail out. And that helps to get the ball rolling. Remember, everything I do has some sort of psychological backing to it. Okay, Even when I do the retrace patterns, I'm not really using Fibonacci per se. I'm using Fibonacci as a, as a retrace number or thereabouts. Like, okay, well, it should retrace deeply. I call it a deep retrace. I'm not necessarily saying you want to buy or sell at that 618 or 782 or whatever they call it. Uh, I'm just saying I've noticed, I've noticed that occasionally, not all the time, but occasionally there's certain times that unfold. So I, there's a psychological reasoning for that. Like with the IPOs, you get that first deep retracement, and there's reasons why that happens. It doesn't necessarily mean it's something magical about some sort of numerology. Okay, now not every pattern, again, will turn into mother of all tops, but all tops will have a pattern. And this is where you always get something good out of Greg, and this is why I quote him so much. In his interview yesterday, he said, they treat every signal like it will turn into a big one. Now, he's running $5 billion over there at Standian, and I think I heard him correctly. I think I heard him say they're in cash. Bam, like a Band-Aid, right? Stop that everything. They're in cash, okay? What a wonderful place to be when you come in day after day and the futures are down 15, 20, 30 points, whatever the case may be. Hey, there are cash. Well, what did we do? We got knocked out. Of, they don't short over there, by the way. But we got knocked out of all but one long, okay? And luckily, the last one got knocked out of the profit. I don't know what the prior, prior ones. I have to go and look at the portfolio, but I think we had a couple of winners in there. But the last one got knocked out as a winner. It didn't make a whole lot. It was kind of like a better than poke in the eye type of deal. And we've got three shorts that are left over, okay? Two out of three of those have hit the profit target, and we're waiting for that Skechers, that aforementioned Skechers, to hit the next one. So they obviously, he's putting his money where his mouth is, or he's putting $5 billion where his mouth is, and he got out of the market. They treat every signal like it will be the big one. And as I quote uh, Judd over there, Dotary, I think is his last name. I hope I got the saying it right. Um, one of the partners over at Standian uh, said that anybody, he's talking about active, he's talking about money managers, any money manager who's out to perform the markets since 2009 should be questioned because they did not, they likely have not taken evasive actions when they should have. And we had a couple of fake out signals over the last few years where I know I got knocked out of all my positions and I know I put a few shorts on. And then what happened, the market turned right back around and went straight back up. It doesn't always do that. Like I said in today's column, it was Africa hot all summer here near New Orleans, Louisiana. Today it was in the 40s outside. I'd have the door open now, but the animal noises. Believe it or not, the mic will pick up crickets for some reason. I know it's probably uh, – hope, hopefully those crickets aren't you guys just saying <laughs> – just sitting there in silence. Uh, but yeah, if there's something about the pitch of a cricket, it'll, it'll actually pick that up. But otherwise, I'd have a door. I had the door open right before the presentation. But it's cold, or it's cool this morning. Let's just say cool. I know so many people live in places where you actually, it actually does get cold. So that's not cold for you. But if you just were here that brief period of time, and had somebody asked you to describe New Orleans, you'd be like, "It's freaking Africa hot." So you don't know that it does occasionally get cold here. I, we, uh, you know, every five years or so, we'll see a little snow even. So if you haven't been trading very long, you haven't weathered a bear market. So you don't know what can happen, what can actually happen. So you got to treat every signal like it's a turn into the big one. And uh, a saying with the aforementioned uh, business partner I was talking about, one of its sayings was, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. And, yeah, you get beat up a little bit. Yeah, you get faked out in markets like we've been getting faked out last few years. And, you know, like Peter Tosh, you just got to pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and you start all over again. But at least you're not decimated in the process. At least you're not wiped out. If you lose all your chips, you can no longer pay, play. So you lose a little bit. So what? 
you go back to following the long-term trend as the trend resumes, and that's all you do, okay? Now, um, I left this in here just in case this turns into the mother of all micromanagement examples, and the question was about Skechers. It's kind of meandering down here and going up a little bit in spite of the market going down. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to let the stop get stopped. We're going to let the stop get taken out, or we're going to let it not take the stop out and, and give us a really big profit, okay? Now, let's talk a little bit about the signals off of major highs and second mouse signals. The S&P made an all-time high. It made a bow tie down. And technically, your trigger, your signal, your trigger, your signal, your trigger, your trigger would have been here. But it really didn't take out that low by that much. So if you gave it a little wiggle room and waited for a little confirmation, you shouldn't have gotten trapped in to that signal. It did what happened. It turned around and went right back up. And this, this is not, a, this is a minor bow tie here. So I don't really pay much attention to these. I pay attention to major bow ties, meaning that you go back in time from when the bow tie started and that's your major top. You're going to find, now sometimes you could stop down the process, but you're going to find that a lot of times the market will make a bow tie down, and that will be the ultimate high. It might come back up and retrace, it retest that high and then make another second signal or whatever. But a lot of times that first bow tie will be the all-time or near the all-time high. It doesn't mean that you can't, that you won't get stopped out in the process and have to take another stab at it. But go back and look at that throughout history, and you'll be pretty amazed. Go look at the top of gold from a few years ago, go look at the top in bonds from a few years back, and you'll see that those signals were there. It, it, and again, just go back throughout history and study all these things. But notice that the market just kind of made marginal new highs from this peak. It never really got further past it. Now, like I've been saying quite a bit, double tops are either overshoot. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Don't worry. They undershoot. They rarely work out perfectly like that. Okay, go back and watch every other <laughs> presentation I've done so far this year. But now you got what I call the second mouse signal. And obviously we sold off significantly since then. But this is an all-time high. And it's back to back. So you get one and then that second one. Sometimes, like I said, the second mouse gets the cheese. I caught I caught the mother of all rats this morning. <laughs> so he didn't he didn't get the cheese. Uh, I wonder if the, I need to go and look see if the the the, the cheese is missing. I wonder if there was a second rat that got the cheese. Anyway, I digress. We've got the, it's been been a rat in a garage I've been dealing with. Uh, the euro was another great example of you had the signal here, really didn't kind of pan out, but notice that it never did really get past that old high. So the clock was ticking from this point forward. And then again, that second signal was the real signal. So if you got knocked out of the first signal, you come back in, you know, pick yourself up, dust yourself off. Uh, he who fights and runs away lives a fight another day. And then look what happened with the euro. And that's just one of many, 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 many historical tops. Um, I wish I had the time. I would go in and I would find all these charts and show you them. If, if you guys want to um, uh, give me dates and markets, I'll, I'll do it, and uh, we'll do a presentation one day on that. I think you're going to be blown away that every top had a signal. Um, I forgot to take this out, but this one did stop out. The Zen did stop out around 20 bucks a share. So that was like the last long. And these three, sh this, these shorts, this one, this one, and this one are, oh, I'm sorry, it's not a short. And the rad are still on. This one actually did hit the initial profit target. So I'll give you a portfolio update next week if you want one. Just let me know. All right. Chief Woman really wound up today. As uh, I've been saying, I do have the store open on the site, so check it out. And the reason the store is open is because, again, not to beat the dead horse, somebody said, Dave, you have really good stuff, which I thought was a very nice compliment. And then he said, why do you hide it? It's like you're ashamed of it. And you know what? I'm not ashamed of it. And it's there, and I think it's good stuff. So so there. All right. Um, I think that's it for now. All right. So check that out. Any questions about anything so far? And if not, we'll go. Oh, here we go. On your stops and don't micromanage, of course, depends on confidence in stop placement. Okay. Well, before I 
read the rest of your question. Um, your confidence in the stop placement needs to be that you are confident you are outside of the normal noise of the vol of the market, or you have some sort of pattern in place which allows you to place that stop within the normal noise of the market. For instance, what did I say today about an opening gap reversal? Okay. I said, watch for an opening gap reversal. I'm not always this right. Trust me, okay? Ask my wife if you don't believe me, right? That's a great thing about uh, being married. You get humbled quite often, you know? Hey, I just got a, I just made this uh, big trade. I did this thing, and I did this. I wrote a book, and uh, just got published in Korea. <laughs> okay, uh, can you remember to take the garbage out? Okay. So I'm not always this right, but look what happened this morning. Market lapped down and found its low almost immediately and turned right back up. What did I say? Watch for an opening gap reversal. When a case like this, you could say, all right, well, I'm going to put a stop in right there, or I'm going to put in a stop right here and take a little day trade just for SGs, put a little money in the account, you know, a couple of bucks at the piece, the spiders, better than poking the eye, right? It's not the bread and butter. This is not how we make our living, but this is how we make some money, okay? on the side. This is how we pay for the electric bill for a month or two, or hopefully a year. But in this particular case, our stop is fairly tight, and we know it's fairly tight because the market's so oversold that it, it should it should it should be the keyword reverse somewhere in this area. And if it doesn't, so what? We get stopped out at a very tight small stop. Now, if you're doing something other than day trading, maybe in some cases you might have, rarely, it, it doesn't happen often, but rarely you may have a setup where you can use a tight stop. Since we're entering into what could be a bear market, I don't know yet, I'm just a trend follower, and I'm just going to follow along, but sometimes you'll have like a witch hat type of pattern. This market just goes straight up, it's so overbought, but you know the trend is down. And sometimes you'll get that opening gap reversal, and you can put in a stop right above that and attempt to capture a longer-term trend, okay? So there are a couple times when you might be able to put in that super tight stop. So where am I going with this? 99.9% .9 of the rest of the time, you're going to have to make sure you're well outside that volatility. In fact, even if you do decide to trade this particular situation, I would still use a liberal stop unless you just try to take a stab at something. So how do you gain confidence in that stop? Well, just know that you're outside of normal volatility. If a stock bounces around four and five and six points a day and you're using a two-point stop, I can guarantee you you're going to get stopped out. As I preached, and I was giving a seminar once, and I was over in San Francisco, and I said, uh, you know, here's a stop, and uh, we had about a 20% stop on this position, and it rallied up, and we got our 20% profit out, and the guy's raised his hand. Uh, but uh, popular method says to use 8% stop, and I said, using an 8% stop on every stock is like saying that everyone in this room should wear a medium-sized shirt. Okay? My fat ass barely fits into an XL. <laughs> Some of my designer clothes, I wear, you know, because I don't know why they make them so small, but I wear a triple XL in certain brands, okay? And I'm and I'm a little nervous after getting on the scale recently. I'm a little nervous that the triple XLs might not fit me. So if I get a speaking engagement, I better do something quickly. I better walk an extra mile a day or something because I'm not going to fit in those clothes, okay? I'm going to have a wardrobe malfunction. So as long as you're outside the normal volatility, then you should be confident that your stop is placed well. Furthermore, if you have if you have a pattern and you know that it's a good pattern, okay, such as your bow tie off of all time highs or whatever, you should have enough confidence in your methodology. If you are a good stock picker, okay, and Robert, I think you're you and I are talking. I think you're going to uh, Robert's uh, in the process of. Uh, purchasing the stock selection course. I mean, not the soft sell you, but I spent 14 hours talking about how to pick stocks. So if you're picking stocks properly, then the setting the stop should be easy. 
Okay, you just eyeball it and make sure you're outside of the normal volatility and make sure you got the pattern there, make sure you got patterns backing it up. Why have I been beating a dead horse about paying attention to what's going on in the peas? Okay, not that you want to just trade an efficient market like the peas. You want to try to find those inefficient stops. Okay, but in the peas, we had a marginal new high. I'm sorry, a marginal new double top, which was an all time high followed by a bow tie off of all-time high. So the signals were there. The signs were there. So make sure you've got the signs. Make sure you're picking the best of the best stocks. Like I said, I've gotten several emails. One was 19, one was 21, and, and one was uh, maybe 20 or so. But the number 20 comes to mind. I know I've told the story a thousand times. Dave, I got stopped out 20 times in a row. It's like, whoa. First of all, either your stops are too tight and I fix a lot of people like that. Hey, Dave, I'm thinking about doing a mentoring with you. I don't, I haven't done them lately. I think if I did them, I'd probably charge about ten grand, just to just to keep the um, amount of people down. But uh, I haven't done them in a few years. But if I did it, I'd probably do about. I'd probably work with somebody for about ten grand. And it, and I, I work myself out of a job there on many occasions because I do like a little pre-interview with them, and I would say. They're like, oh, I'm getting stopped out at time and time. It's like, well, your stops are too tight. Loosen your stops. I mean, you know, I'll get a phone call a week later. Uh, hey, Dave, hey, you calling the mentor? No, 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 I don't need you anymore because I loosened my stops, and now I'm making a lot of money, and I've catching a lot of trades. So thank you. So I, I kind of work my – I probably shouldn't tell you that until, um, it, until the check clears the bank, okay? But I have cured a lot of people. It had, I haven't made a dime doing it, trust me. I've cured a lot of people – by simply telling them to loosen up your stops, that your stops are too tight. Because if you catch the secret to the secret sauce, the juice, you like it, the juice, you want it, the juice, the secret sauce is capturing that longer term trade, is capturing those outliers, that nice little rad trade we just talked about. Maybe sketches will implode and turn into a $5 stock. Who knows? Okay. But the secret is capturing those one or two or three occasional big winners. That pays for your month, your 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 quarter, and maybe even your year. Okay, so you have confidence because you have confidence in yourself. Confidence comes with experience. Okay, confidence comes with knowing that you're picking the best of the best stocks. That you're that you're not using you're using intuition and not into wishing, like they said in one of the market wizards. Okay, brilliant statement. And then you know that your stops are outside of that normal volatility. Now, that's a long-winded long, long, tangent there without answering the rest of the question. Let's see what the rest of the question is. Okay, basically, volatility should always at least be aware of and consider key technical levels. Um, what's the rest of the question? Can you address the thinking on stop placement, your strategy, generally, and how... How was that implemented at SKX? Well, let me see what the stop was at XKX, and then uh, I'll let you know. He's laughing at something. What did I say? Who knows what I said? <laughs> oh, the wife comment. Yeah. Oh, that was that was a while back. Okay, let's see. Uh, Skechers had original stop of seven points away, fifty-two, fifty-seven points. So let's take a look at what was what was my thinking on that one. Fifty-two, fifty. You want to give them a little room so you don't get uh, triggered in by accident. In about seven points, so probably about right here somewhere. So. Number one, you want to be outside of normal volatility. Look at the volatility of this market. Look at the wide. That's a pretty big bar, okay? And that was just in one day's move, okay? So you want to be outside of that volatility. And also, the other thing you need to ask yourself is, where would I be wrong? And somewhere around 60 round numbers, okay, I would probably be wrong there. I mean, ideally... You know, you should maybe give it all the way back to new highs, and you can if you're trying to catch the mother of all trades. Well, that's what we're trying to do, but we'd rather just try to catch a swing trade first 
and then stay with it as opposed to try to catch the mother of all trades going in. If you wanted to try to be a longer-term trader, which is the ultimate goal, by the way, but it has its problems, and that's why we take the hybrid approach of the short term and then stick with things that they work out. But if you were to try to be an ulti uh, the ultimate goal and try to be a, a longer-term trader, then your stop would go in above the high because that's a point where you know you are wrong. You're definitely wrong. You're no longer a trend follower. The market is making new highs. Okay? So you want to make sure you're outside of normal volatility. Just eyeball it. Look to see if there's any big wide-range bars like this. Okay, and I bet if you measure that, you'll see that this stop is not too, too much bigger than that, but certainly bigger than that one bar in there, okay? So that's how you set stops. Then the secret is like escargo. It's all in the sauce. There was a stale once, and he, he had a little S painted on his car, and I'm like, what the hell? And it's like, well, I want people to see me and say, hey, look at that escargo. Speaking of what the hell, there's a snail knocked on my door once, and I was like, get out of here, and I threw him out in the yard. Two years later, I hear knocking on the door, open the door, the snail says, what the hell? All right. <laughs> uh, okay, base stops, general and volatility and avoided market noise, but should you also be at least be aware of, consider key technical levels in your chart setting stop? Absolutely. Okay, that's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up, Robert. Very, very, uh, it's very astute of you. So the other thing you want to look at, again, this is why I said, where would you obviously be wrong? And then, or there are other, so, like, so sometimes you'll get a market that'll do this, and then you get a breakdown, and then a little uh, a little pullback. And then say this is a bow tie. It could be anything, a first thrust or, or whatever, but say it's a bow tie. Well, normal volatility might say, okay, my stop needs to be here. But, hey, you got this base up here, so let me just put it into the base a little bit. Because if it comes back into the base, I want to get out. Okay, so absolutely look, you know, number one, eyeball the volatility. Number two, look to see if there's some sort of spot where you would obviously be wrong, which kind of dovetails in or is kind of the same analogy as look for some other type of technical pattern where a market shouldn't go through. Okay, where would you be wrong? That's the beauty of these transitional setups, and that's one reason I love them is because if they get all the way back to new highs, you know you're wrong. The problem with something like a pullback, as I've said at nauseam, I know it's kind of hard to believe me saying something in nauseam, huh? But the problem with a pullback is, let's say a pullback triggers, okay, and then it starts pulling back some more. Well, you don't know how much that thing's going to pull back, pull back, pull back. So you have to stop yourself out somewhere. Then, of course, when you do, what happens? It turns around, goes straight back up. It pisses you off. So you don't really know for sure where that stop should be, but you have an idea. You know that you're, you're going to probably get a reversion to the mean move. You know that that rubber band is stretched to the downside in the pullback, and you know the volatility of the market. So you put that stop right about where it should stop going down before it hits that point. If it gets to that point, maybe it's, it's going to keep on going down. But you never know for sure, whereas with a transitional setup, especially something like a gatekeeper type of pattern, which was in a 10 best, you know you're so close to the old highs when you're selling it. If it goes on to make new highs, then you know that you've got to get out. Okay? All right. Let's uh, – I think I've pontificated enough for today. Let's, uh, let's get into the overall market. Let's talk about markets. Okay? Um, what I like to do – you guys can start asking about it. Oh, you're welcome, Robert. Uh, you guys should start act, asking about individual stocks now, and uh, I'll get to those as soon as the uh, we get through the markets. Okay, let's take a look at the spiders first. Let's look at the micro, then work our way out to the macro. I mean, first of all, this market. You know, Dave, how do you know market is how do you know market is oversold? Well, like Justice, what's his name? Justice Potter Smith. I'll know it when I see it. All right, take a look at the P's. What day was that? I wonder if I had the bear on the cover that day. What did I have on the cover of my website? 918. I don't think I had the calendar up there anymore. Um, that would be fun to do, just for SMGs. Next free webinar. 918 of September. 
<laughs> was that it? Was that nine eighteen? What day was that? Oh no, no. Well, it's it's kind of funny though. <laughs> Little known fact: some time, some bear attacks begin with a polite knock on your door. Okay. Anyway, I digress. Uh, I was kind of hoping we had something right around that time, but uh, close enough. Anyway, the question, Dave, how do you know it was sold? Well, you know, what's his name, Potter Smith? I'll know it when I see it. Okay. We went from there all the way to there over a short period of time. And then we went from here all the way to here over a short period of time. That is oversold. You have to base it on the volatility of the market. The peas, or in this case the spiders, have a historical volatility rating of 12, which is pretty low. Trust me, a move from here to here, that is not a 12 on the HV. It probably was like a 9 or a 10 when we got started. But this is a move that's much, much bigger. So it's well outside of the normal volatility as measured over the last 50 days being quote-unquote normal. Okay, without getting too far into historical volatility, it's we we're looking at a 50-day historical volatility of the market. So we know that this action is outside of the recent volatility of the market. So the market's oversold. It's also dropped a lot. Just eyeball it. It's not rocket surgery. Okay, but you can see we did that a big lap this morning. We're oversold. We're due to bounce. Okay, now that in of, of itself doesn't mean you should rush out and buy the market. Unless, of course, you're you're doing a little morning in the morning, uh, you know, a little flip, you know, pay for your uh, pay for your webinar today, just a little uh, a little a flip, a little ogre flip, and then you know, if you want to thank me for it, fine, uh, buy a flash drive or something. Okay, there you go. See, I'm no longer afraid to sell. All right, P is very, 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 very oversold. What I found fascinating yesterday was yesterday felt like a victory because we came so far off the lows. But, but, we still are down over three quarters of a percent. That's a pretty serious slide for the market. I guess lately it doesn't seem like much. Oh, just three quarters percent. You know, it's kind of like, it's all relative. You know, it's like, but what concerned me was, if you look at, and I don't want to digress too far, but tobacco, tobacco got whacked yesterday. Okay, uh, was it telecom? Yeah, telecom got whacked yesterday. Of course, telecom was already in a downtrend, but health services got whacked yesterday. What else got whacked? Retail got whacked yesterday, several percent loss. Look at that implosion, okay? And on a relative strength basis, a few days ago, retail was really hanging in there. Insurance. Bam, it got whacked yesterday. Oh, yeah, off its worst level, but still down significantly nonetheless. And even utilities, although they weren't down that much by the end of the day, they got whacked pretty hard, and it was still down enough, okay? What was it, 0.8% uh, or more? Yeah, they were down 0.8%. Well, so, so was the market. But wait a minute. Utilities in general aren't usually as volatile as the overall market. I guess they are now. So that's a pretty big move in utilities, especially when you when you factor in that they tailed lower. Banks, great example of what I'm trying to point out. Down over two and a half percent yesterday. Off the worst levels, okay, but down two and a half percent nonetheless. So even though the market kind of stabilized yesterday, I was blown away by the amount of Okay, John, see you next week. Uh, I was blown away by the amount of sectors that got really whacked yesterday. So it's almost like it's like the rolling bear or the bear market caught up to all these other areas. And it's kind of like the, the sink and ship analogy because someone yesterday, uh, I don't know if he's in here or not today. Fred, you in here? Say hello. Uh, Fred said, hey, I noticed that the Russell isn't going down as fast as the rest of them. And that's that's true. That's because those smaller cap stocks are already sold out, okay? And that's why they're at such low levels. Hey, Fred, good to see you. Yeah, Fred said that. So good point, Fred. Uh, and just because they're going down less than the rest of the market, let's take a look at that real quick. Uh, just because these small cap stocks are kind of meandering down here, 
doesn't mean we want to rush out and buy the Russell. And the reason is because just draw your arrow and then look at look at the overhead supply. It's got to get through. Okay, so Russell still still looks pretty good, pretty bad. Let's take a look at Nasdaq, and then I just want to look at a couple more sectors, and we'll open it up. Nasdaq getting a little bounce intraday, still down in the day though. Okay, still down over a half percent, and that's nothing to sneeze about. That's a pretty big move lower. Okay, 100 days of a half percent move is what? Well, uh, technically, I guess it wouldn't be zero, but it still would be a lot. Um, but again, NASDAQ severely oversold. By the way, the moving averages on these markets, uh, the 200-day moving average, and the reason I use the 200 because it's well-watched. Okay, In general, I like to use um, exponentials, but 200-day moving average got taken out like butter. Notice the daylight, meaning that the lows are greater than the moving average. We've had daylight, I don't know about this kiss right here, but for the most part, we've had daylight for two years so if all you did was say, I'm going to stay along the NASDAQ as long as it stays above its 200-day moving average, then you'd have been long for two years. And guess what? You would have doubled your money. I'm just kind of looking at that. Now, it's not always this easy. There will be whipsaws, and it won't test out, okay, all caveats um, um, aside. It's kind of like um, Tom McClellan gave his speech a couple of years ago at the AAPTA meeting and hit a, a big, long disclaimer. One of them, you know, all these things in case of uh, fire, um, in case of rash, just continue using. One of the disclaimers, if you read closely, was if if you if you smoke after sex, you're doing it too fast. So I just thought that was kind of funny. Um, so all disclaimers aside, you can see just a simple little system saying that I'm going to buy or, or stay long, I should say, as long as the market is above its 200-day moving average, would have kept you in for two whole years of that trend. It's amazing how these simple trend-following systems, hey, hey look, didn't even touch it right there. Look how cool that is. I mean, I know I'm a nerd, but that's that's awesome. And then just recently, we began to break below that 200-day. Okay. Um, I think that's – let me just show you one or two things. Bonds. I'm glad to see bonds have caught a bid as of late, and gold has caught a tiny, 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 tiny bit of a bid. Okay. Uh, and it's kind of worked its way higher a little bit. The reason I'm excited about this is because – if bonds and gold get sold and the overall market's going down, that means that somebody's in trouble and somebody's in big trouble and somebody's got to raise cash fast. When you see gold go up and bonds go up as a flight to safety, it means that somebody still has some cash left to buy, something at least, okay? So it's not a, it's not a let's go out and kiss each other signal. But it is a good thing to see that happen. But when you do see when you see gold dropping like a stone, especially given today's news, okay, not that you want to factor in news, but given today's news, wars, Ebola, Nick and Mariah breaking up, you know, uh, uh, what's his name? Shabaya, what's his name? Uh, LaBeouf, what's his name? Getting arrested. You know, all these things are happening, and somehow gold's just going down in spite of it all. So that uh, can be a, a kind of a, a scary thing. Okay, most sectors, I'm not going to bore you and go through too many of them. Let me just show you one or two more. Um, take energies, for instance, uh, would probably be chemicals, good example. You know, most sectors have just kind of imploded as of late. Some like chemicals offer just make a new highs, kind of like the overall market. No big surprise there. Energies have imploded quite a bit as of late. Most sectors look just like that. Most sectors look like the overall market. They've imploded, okay? Um, gold kind of scraping bottom a little bit. If you go back two or three columns, I said, Maybe keep an eye on some of these sectors that are already scraping bottom. I'm not saying rush out and buy them, but keep an eye on them. Wait for that bow tie. Wait for that first thrust. Wait for that setup, and then you might want to go after them. Okay? All right, let's open it up for stocks, or let's keep it open, I guess. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. James wants to know about Mo. Mo is a tobacco company, obviously. Now, Mo looks like a long, and it looks okay. Am I going to go after it? No. Why not, Dave? Well, I'll tell you why. Because I woke up this morning, and I not only wrote a column, I actually proofread and read the column. And what did I say in my column this morning? If I could find it. I said... 
wait for it. I said that when the sink, when the ship begins to sink, what happens? The small caps are usually the first to go. You have a rush towards the large cap and then slash defensive issues. These defensive issues are towards the bow of the boat and then those are the last to go. By the way, we've got a submarine pattern in the S&Ps. In case you guys don't know what that is, let me show you what that is. Um, submarine pattern, let me just let me clean the chart up a little bit. All right, let's see, let's see, this is like this. Okay, and I uh, like that. And we'll get the little deal. Let's see. This is one of the hardest of all technical analysis patterns to draw, the submarine pattern. But there it is, in case you're wondering. There's definitely, it's pretty obvious to me. I mean, I don't know. I could be wrong. But uh, it's pretty obvious to me that we have a submarine pattern in the S&P 500. In fact, I need to get a, I'm going to get a screenshot of this, all joking aside, and I'm going to post it in the um, app to form. <laughs> Love your sense of humor in this market. Well, yeah, I mean, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, we're trend-following morons. It's going down. Got stopped out of some longs, you know. F sucks. Hey, guess what? Shorts are working. Okay, that's better than poking the eye. He's following the market down. Okay, signs. Big tail in S&P yesterday. IWM had closed higher than open today. Could make three. IWM yesterday's wide range bar. Huge day, light vibe. Well, you might be reading too much into uh, Howard's making a case for a bounce, and I agree with you. My case is that the market's oversold. It's going to bounce. Okay. But who knows? It could go even further. I mean, oversold could always be more oversold. Don't get too caught up in the micro of a situation, and that's where you get in a lot of trouble. And like the Skechers, or Skechers, it's like, okay, it's going up. It should be going down, but we're not stopped out yet. You get caught up in the micro and, and try to analyze everything too much, you get in a lot of trouble really fast, okay? Here's the deal. Your methodology saved me money from not being long at the wrong time. Thank you. You're welcome, Eric. Checks in the mail, Eric. <laughs> you really do make me laugh, John. Well, uh, I hope I wasn't being, uh, was I being funny? Is that a yellow submarine? You know, it can be. We could, uh, we could make it yellow. Haven't seen that pattern on my charting system. Should I change? <laughs> yeah, you need to need to look for you to study the submarine pattern, you know. Do you consider expansion in the VIX or the setting of particular stocks, stop level or stock itself? No, I don't worry about the VIX too much. What is the VXX? What is that based on? Oh, that's see that's based on futures. Okay. You can get a lot of this is where <laughs> I actually wrote about I'm writing about this, I should say. Um, I talked about the, the siren call of derivatives and such, and the problem is that this is a derivative based on a derivative based on a derivative. It's the VIX, which is the derivative. It's the futures of the derivative, futures of the VIX, which is derivative, and then you got a derivative in that it's an ETF of a derivative. So it's a derivative of a derivative of a derivative. Uh, I saw Larry McMillan speak a while back, and it, he speaks at a little bit higher level. Uh, he's obviously he's options uh, expert extraordinaire, and he speaks at a little bit. Um, did I say Williams? I meant Mc, uh, McMillan is what I meant to say. Um, I saw Larry speak a while back, and he was explaining how a lot of money is lost in instruments like the VXX because they're basing the price on the futures. And the futures have a really bad decay aspect to them based on the way the VIX. The VIX is more of a perpetual thing. Every day it's a perpetual 30 days and the futures are not. And people don't realize that the VXX is based on the futures. Now, I don't want to dig myself a hole and show you how little I know, but I'll tell you right now, just know that you can get into a lot of trouble trading something like the VXX. 
So my advice to you is don't do it unless you're trading some sort of like mean reversion system, but be really, really, really careful, okay? That's brilliant. What's brilliant? I talk too much. I don't know. I don't remember what I said. Um... Yeah, don't don't get too caught up in the VIX. I mean, you know, take a peek at the VIX. The VIX, just the old generic VIX is fine, okay. And you can see we got stretched to the upside here. We're probably due for a little reversion to the mean move. Um, I've got somebody from Canada that that follows my VIX systems from years ago, which are uh, were inspired or, or or in part part of them are probably um, uh, Larry Connor's research and all. I don't follow them anymore. But every now and then, he'll send me the signal and, and tell me that it worked. Well, they stopped working for a while because the, the volatility dried up. But when volatility comes back into the market, yeah, it's worth taking a peek at it. And, and then by the end of the day, we'll have a buy signal. And you can come in today and say, okay, the VIX is stretch, open a gap reverse. I'm going to come in and play a little day trade. You know, that's great. That's fine. Make a little money. Put a little money in your pocket. I'm, I'm glad I could help. But keep your eye on the bigger picture. Keep your eye on the ball, okay? James wants to know about IMDZ. It's going to be too. It's going to be. It's. I'm going to show it, but it's too thin. It's too thin for uh for everyone, but it's okay as an IPO. Uh, this is one I'm actually going to show to, in tomorrow's IPO follow up session. And it did a couple things that were really cool. One, it triggered an entry right about here without giving away the secret sauce. Uh, just know that it IPOs. There is a breakout characteristic, and you could do quite well with the breakout characteristic. So this is going to be one of my examples for tomorrow. Uh, 50,000 on average volume, let's just say 60,000 on average volume, a little bit thin, so you got to be super careful. But as a private trader, we could still trade these things, okay? In a trading service, I, I go with a little bit thicker stock, um, just so we all could get in and, and nobody stepping on each other. But, yeah, absolutely, it's a trend knockout. It looks pretty good, okay? The overall market's a little iffy. Now that's something. Now when it comes to the sink and ship, the IPOs are kind of a moving target. Um, let's see. And what I'm saying by that is, it's like the IPOs are down here with the small caps, but then they kind of. It's like sometimes, and I don't know how to explain this, so I'm just going to talk. I know it's a shocker. But sometimes you have a, a market where people kind of give up on stocks, but they're willing to fritter away a little bit of money and do something really speculative like an IPO. It's kind of like the money's got to go somewhere, and it's like the rat runs up the ship, okay? And then at some point right in here, it's like they abandon the IPOs, but then they can like revisit them again. And it's kind of a it's kind of a hard thing to kind of quantify. So I have seen situations where even in crappy markets, IPOs can be worthwhile. It's like this this it's like right now super micro cap or or, or very small stocks at least. There's a few out there that have made some incredible moves. I had STP, STP was it STP? Uh, the name escapes me at the moment. I can look back at the list and see. Was it STP? Was it, uh, I forget, not Lake, but it was one of those. Anyway, I had one that was in my Landry list that went up like 200% recently. Okay, and I'm not saying it to brag. I'm just saying that to prove a point. Sometimes these super speculative issues can still get a bid. Was it, uh, which one was it? Anybody, anybody on the service know which one it was? Uh, it was huge. Oh, this thing's acting up. Let's see, 10th. STRP, that's it, that's it. Yeah, I had it. Uh, I had that on the Landry list not too long ago, uh, like back here somewhere on a pullback or whatever. It, it took off from there. So, yeah, you're getting some. There's still some. It's like everybody's running, rushing from speculative issues in general. They're run, they're running up the ship, okay, and then it's kind of like right around the top here. It's like they dump these issues and then they they dabble a little bit down here again, and then the ship sinks. And then it bottoms out, and then we start the process over again, I suppose. Thank you, Howard. BCRX for Mr. Allen. Thanks for hanging out. BCRX. Been long, spinoff strip. Similar to IPO. Yeah, yeah. It's like you get that last little pop. Uh, what do you want to do with BCRX? I don't see what you should do with this. 
if you're short, stay short, but it's kind of wide, loose. I don't know what I would do with that. Uh, tell me what you want to do with it first. WES. I wouldn't do anything with it. But stay short if you're short. Yeah, this looks kind of interesting. Uh, really thin, though, so it is a short, uh, or possibly a short, I should say. Too thin to short. Uh, this retrace is a little extreme in here, but it's kind of interesting in that you could put in an entry down here, and it, it may not ever trigger. Uh, but yeah, it looks like a stock that was in trouble, then it got it got squeezed, the shorts got squeezed, and then sometimes uh, you'll get that big squeeze and the move lower. Um, as a pattern in and of itself, it's something I wouldn't necessarily rush out and trade, but I can see, I hear you, it's kind of like a push into the resistance, and now it could be stalling out. Um, for the most part, I'd avoid that one, but yeah, it still looks like it's in trouble. But here's the deal: it's only to go. It's look how you support at 60, so it doesn't have that far to go. So I would pass on that too. But it's also too thin. Okay. DXO went up, up away. Perhaps has stopped its run. Uh, let's take a look at UUP. Um, well, it's okay so far. I would I would put this as a long. Uh, you know, HV pretty low uh, because it's a it's a dollar fund. I'd rather trade the forex outright instead of this. But yeah, it's had a pretty good run, and it's had a pullback. If you are going to trade forex, by the way, you're much better off. Like we just showed that euro chart. You want to trade the fringes using emerging type of pattern. So you want to trade that bow tie off of all time highs or all time lows, whatever the case may be. Okay, was it Lake? No, it was a STRP. We can look at Lake if you want. So Lake's another one of those examples. It's last kind of gasp. It's like, you know, okay, I'm getting ready to jump off the ship, but let me just go after one of these little speculative issues first. John wants Vips as a short. Um, I'm going to caution against that. The pattern's there. Uh, well, it's not Vips. I'm thinking of something else. There was one yesterday I saw. Okay, never mind. I'm thinking of an IPO. Um... Well, it's pretty choppy in its rollover, and now it's kind of coming back. I don't know. I don't see it. Um, it's probably a bow tie. It's kind of a sloppy bow tie. Now, sometimes you do get these gradual rollovers, and then they begin to accelerate. But at this point in time, I'd almost prefer, like the Skechers, which hasn't worked yet, obviously, a market that kind of looks like this, just kind of like a sharp sell-off. Because the most amount of people are on the wrong side. You know, take a look at URI, for instance. Um, you know, the reason I like this one, because it had that first thrust, and it just kind of began to implode, and it pulled back a little bit. It's kind of like Go-Go Nomo, or it is Go-Go Nomo, okay? It's having a big day today, but hey, so what? Who cares, okay? Actually, I just dropped a, a mental F-bomb. How's that? <laughs> so... If it gets stopped out, who cares? Better than poking the eye, okay? DSR, same as APT. DSR, yeah, okay. Well, that's kind of a, well, it's not too thin anymore. All right. XNPT, is that Xena something? Uh, no. No, it's just kind of crawling its way higher. It's got, it's wide and loose. It's got issues. It's got overhead resistance. Yeah, there's nothing there for me. HDB. HDB. Yeah, it looks like a bank that could be in trouble. Um, but here's the problem. Okay, first of all, let me interview myself. Does it look like a top? Absolutely. Would I trade it? No. Because you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You got ten days in the pullback. Usually on a short, you want to see something just trigger and not look back. If you're short, stay short, but for me to get excited, you have to break below this range and then set up again. Okay, T-VIX, another one of those crazy, stupid VIX things. They're stupid. They're just ridiculous. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I mean, T-VIX is two times. Yeah, there's a, deriv there's a leverage derivative of a derivative of a derivative of an exchange of a note. <laughs> exchange traded, um, not note, exchange traded. I always forget what that means, not note. What does it mean? A network or something, which is like a fake thing. It's a fake thing because it doesn't actually exist. It's 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 um. I don't know how to explain it. What does ETN stand for? I always forget. Is it is it is it a network or something? It's it, it's like a, it's something that's really fake. I can't explain what it is. It's like a, 
electronic it's like electronically created thing. It's not like a like you look at that it, let's say you look at Google or IBM or whatever, you look at that, a blip. Exchange traded is it exchange traded note? Are y'all sure it's a note? But it's like, yeah, if you look at a stock, at least you know that there is a stock underneath that, and that company is worth whatever that price is, whereas these notes or whatever they're called, um, they're notes? I want to confirm that. ETN, all right. Yeah, subject to viability of lender. Good point. Uh, Susan says, exchange-traded notes subject to viability of lender. Yeah, I, th I thought it was network or something, but either way, it's something that's fake. An exchange traded notes or ETN is a senior unsecured. Yeah, it's unsecured, unsubordinated debt security. Oh, that's why it's a debt security. Thank you, Heather. Uh, debt security issued by the underwriting bank, similar to other debt securities. ETNs have a maturity date and are backed only by the credit of the issuer. Yeah. So you got this note, which is create. I'm going to create a note and call it two times the VIX, and, and we'll just make up some sort of. Um, some sort of value for it. <laughs> Stupid. Okay. Yeah, they're notes. Stay away from them as a general statement. I'm, I recommended one on an institutional project once, and I got my butt handed to me for being stupid. But it worked out. It went up like 40%, so I'm like, well, I was right. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, <laughs> Yeah, but you picked up nickels in front of that bulldozer. I was like, well, I was right, though. Wasn't that right? But, yeah, you're right. I picked up nickels in front of a bulldozer. Uh, Google? What do you want to do with Google? You want to short it? Google looks like the mother of all tops. Um, but it doesn't look like a short. Uh, I like them. I like to short them when they're coming off all-time highs. Uh, I hear you, though. I mean, maybe if it pulls back a little bit, we could reevaluate it. Okay. Thank you, Leon. MU for Phil. Yeah, this is a this is the this is one of the problems with um, with trading these transitional setups. We had MU as a setup recently, and we got stopped out of it, and then it died. Okay, as a short. So you will sometimes be right, but early. But notice that it never did get past this prior peak in here. Not that you want to necessarily get in a trade and ride it all the way back up to that prior peak. But the point I'm trying to make is a lot of times that first signal will signal the um, the top, okay? Uh, yeah, as far as a new setup, Phil, it looks fantastic. Uh, you got gaps down, you got double top, second mouse, uh, probably headed to $20, $20 a share or so. And then after that, uh, maybe 10 bucks a share. But yeah, high five. And I'm not just saying that because you're on the service. Anything oil was worse whacking. Yeah, the oil's got whacked pretty hard. Baba, I, you know, I was getting ready to pull up Baba because I was like, let me pull up Baba because somebody's going to ask about it, okay? B-A-B-A. -A. Um, like I said last week, without giving away too much of the course, and here's the deal, you know, people going to, you know, you're going to go out and buy Baba. And spend ten thousand dollars to buy a hundred shares of Baba, but you're not going to buy a four hundred dollar course on IPOs. Three hundred ninety-seven dollars, I think, even, which will tell you not to buy Baba. <laughs> and I'll tell you right now, don't buy Baba. Okay. Any IPO, without giving it away too much, that makes its high on the first day of trading, and let's call it a one week high on the first day of trading should be avoided, unless, of course, it takes out that high. Then it's a whole different story, okay? Oh, thank you, Alan. I appreciate that. Okay, O-N-V-O. Uh, so Alan's going to go get the course. Good. And we got a webinar tomorrow on the course, too, so don't forget to come to that. Sign up on the website. Uh, Owen, this sort of looks like it's trying to bottom out longer term. It's kind of choppy. Uh, it doesn't really jump out at me as a, as a great-looking setup. Yeah, it's just all over the place longer term. I'd leave this stock alone. Uh, not that it can't get its act together and, and start doing something, but it's all over the place. I'd leave it alone. Shorting Biotech in general, IBB or ILMN. Well, ideally, I like to um, ideally I like to short individual issues, but I think the IBB looks pretty good. 
And the IBB would be a good place to start because you've got a bow tie down off of all-time highs, major highs. Can't be all-time, can it? Oh, my goodness. Where's 99? I guess all those stocks no longer exist. Yeah, that's all-time highs. Yeah, all those stocks probably no longer exist from 1999. But, yeah, that looks fantastic. And here's the other thing, too. I'm not a big fan of ETFs. I'm, I'm actually writing a book called The Lost Art of Stock Selections, and I kind of rip ETFs a new one, especially a derivative of a derivative of a derivative based on a note, based on an inverse, double leverage. Anyway, I'm getting lost and confused. But there are cases where ETFs can be used. It's great. Like, let's say you want to get some exposure to biotech on the short side. An ETF would be a good thing to do. Uh, one of my problems with shorting biotech is what if they come out with a cure for Ebola, okay? Especially if it's a smaller company, that, that could double or triple over a very short period of time. So you've got to be very careful shorting them. But, yeah, if you want to gain some exposure to the overall sector, this is one case I'd make an exception and say, yeah, an ETF might be the way to go. ILMN? And that was the second part of his question. No, oh, I'd say IBB. IBB or ILMN. I think the IBB. And then you could probably find something better in biotech. Okay. Apple. Apple top. Probably. You know, here's the thing. There's all these signs throughout history of, of things that, that usually uh, mean a top is in place. And I'm not just talking about Nick and Mariah getting a divorce. I'm talking about things like um, Apple splitting 10 for 1, okay? That's a sign that we could be in the later phases of a, of a market, of a, of, a, of a mature, or as some people say, mature, of a mature bull market when you see something like Apple split 10 for 1, okay? Um, yeah, I think Apple looks like a top, but... I wouldn't call it top just yet. I wait for a little bit more signals. Um, it's also a big fixed stock, so I would wait on that one. But yeah, if you wanted to be aggressive, I mean, if you wanted to be super aggressive, uh, short below today's low, intraday low, stop above all time highs. Okay, so let's go ahead and write that down as a super aggressive trade. It's not jumping out at me as rolled has rolled over just yet. But, yeah, it's a super aggressive trade. If you were bearish on Apple and you want to short Apple, uh, I would say an entry of today's low, let's say 95, and put a stop in at 104. And what is that? What's 104 minus 95? 104 minus 95, 9 points. So maybe round it up to 10 points. Um Entry of 95, stop 105, and a target of 85. So this would be your first target there. Now that's a very aggressive trade because you don't have a, uh, you don't really have a bona fide sell signal just yet. But I hear you. I mean, it looks like it's in trouble. Okay. Why are the airlines down if all's drop so much? Because, because Ebola. Everybody's flying around with Ebola. Everybody knows that. Okay, it's like everybody knows Pinocchio's a bad motivational speaker. Oh, you, and you, and you, I see potential. In... No, I don't know. Why are airlines down? Because the stock market has gone down. That's the only reason, okay? Um, just because oil is cheap doesn't mean airlines are going to uh, go up. Just because their costs go down. See, that's where you start confusing the issue with facts. Dave, oil's cheap, so airlines should be going up. No. No, airlines are either going up or they're going down, Okay. Draw your up arrow, draw your down arrow, and if you really want to get fancy, draw your submarine pattern in, okay? And that's all you need to know. Don't worry about Ebola, okay? Don't worry about Nick and Mariah. <laughs> Don't worry about anything, okay? Maybe Apple may be at launch event tonight. Well, so what? What? What, did you not hear me say don't worry about all that? <laughs> but, Dave, what about the situation in Nigeria? Well, you know, is Ebola in Nigeria now? That would be kind of um, ironic. Yeah, MU, we like that. We'll be entering MU. Oh, I don't know. Uh, see tonight's service. I might put it on there. People are thriving. Oh, Beyonce's haircut. That's the latest thing? Yeah, that'll be my new thing. 
what's up with TLT? Well, TLT, um, that's your flight to safety, okay? That's bonds. So when the whole world's coming unglued and Beyonce gets a new haircut, okay, you better run for safety. And that's what's happening in bonds. So that's what that's what's up with TLT. Kite for Alan. We're getting kind of. I said, you know, I said we'd have time for everybody, and it looks like we're gonna run out of time. Um, ah, it, it looks okay. It still has a bit of an IPO characteristic to it. I, I hear you. It broke out, kind of came back in a little bit. I think it looks okay. I mean, the IMDZ looks a little bit better, but it's obviously super super thin. So I'd I'd prefer to look go up the IPO look like that than kite. At this particular time, ONVO, that's going to be another IPO. I need to come to the seminar tomorrow, webinar tomorrow. I guess it's a seminar. Oh, no, I'm thinking the wrong stock. It was an IPO back here, I think. Um, uh, we talked about this one, I think. Uh, wait for it to, to make a bow tie up or something. Okay, we talked about UUP already. UUP is going to be a buy. Apple Top, TVIX, Stupid, ERY. All right, looks like we'll get them. We're almost done. Uh, yeah, the problem with the ERY is it's triple leveraged, okay? And uh, this is one thing I'm also writing about. If you do the math on these things, uh, it, on the inverse funds especially, triple leveraged inverse funds, the uh, I don't have the time to get into it now, but let's say the market goes up 20% and it goes up, your, your whatever goes up 60%, then it goes... I'm um, getting myself confused. Just just know that your tracking error is abysmal, and you should only maybe day trade a whole these things for a day or two, but you'll get creamed on them. So avoid them. All. Avoid triple leverage uh, inverse shares and avoid derivative of, of derivative of derivative shares. Maybe that will be the fodder for a, um, for a webinar. Look, we're, we're out of time plus some, so let's go ahead and wrap things up. I have a blast doing these shows, as you can tell, so thank you guys for showing up. I'm humbled by your appearance, and I just – love doing these and as long as you keep showing up i'm going to keep doing them so if you want to stop me from doing them stop showing up <laughs> anyway uh everybody have a fantastic day any unanswered questions you know the routine david dave landry.com we don't talk again between now and then everybody have a fantastic weekend see you guys again next week everybody in the ipo webinar don't forget tomorrow 11 o'clock eastern daylight time thank you so much